Welcome to Classic Comedy of Old Time Radio. I'm your host, Ron Eckelbarger. Here we go with the Bob Hope Show. This is episode number 435, which originally aired on December 6th, 1949. Here now is Bob Hope with his special guest, Jack Benny. For Swan Soap, it's Bob Hope. <laughs> With Doris Day, Jack Kirkwood, Irene Ryan, yours truly, Hi Aberback, Les Brown and his band of renown, and our special guest, Jack Benny. And here he is, Paramount calls him the Great Lover, but Lever Brothers call him the Great Lather, Bob Hope! Thank you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Christmas is coming, Hope. Telling all you people that you and Swan Soap ought to get chummy. It's a soap that's good for brother, sister, dad, and mummy. And if you use it, you'll never feel crummy because the lather's so thick you can lie in the tub and build a snowman on your tummy. <laughs> it's fun. I tried it. <laughs> well, I just got back from Texas. It was wonderful to be down in that Texas sunshine where men are men and women are women. Especially after California where it's so smoggy you just have to guess. <laughs> Yes, sir. The whole country's on instruments out here, aren't they? <laughs> I went to Texas to appear at a milk fun show, see a football game, check an oil well, go quail hunting, and get some rest. It was so much fun, I wish I could have stayed for a second day. <laughs> I really do. And that Texas is really rugged and uh, rough country. It's the only state where the mules whip Frankie Lane. <laughs> Eamon Carter gave me a cowboy hat for Phil Harris, a 20-gallon hat. Has two faucets and a Filipino bartender. <laughs> And are they rich in Texas? They refer to Ali Khan as the sharecropper who married our Rita. <laughs> Rita's husband, Ali Khan, was down in Texas, too. He's trying to strike a midget gusher that will produce baby oil. <laughs> you know, sweet yoga. And they don't have house detectives in the hotels down there. Just a big sign of the transom. Remember, the eyes of Texas are upon you. <laughs> And over the weekend, I saw the Notre Dame SMU football classic. There was a game. What weaving, bobbing, ducking, and squirming. Then just when I get under the fence, they made me go outside and buy a ticket. <laughs> when I walked in the stadium, they really rolled out the red carpet. I was wearing my low-cut polo shirt, and they thought I was Princess Margaret. <laughs> but what a game. It was so tense and exciting. During one play, I looked around at the spectators, and three camels were smoking doctors. <laughs> What a battle. I can't describe how exciting it was, but there was a Chesterfield billboard that went into the stadium, and before the first quarter was over, Arthur Godfrey ran out of cigarettes. <laughs> Most of the Texas boys are farmers, too, you know. In one play, the SMU quarterback put his hand down to the center to get the ball. The center grabbed his fingers, and before they could stop him, he got three quarts of milk. <laughs> Notre Dame was driving down the field in one play when suddenly the captain said, we better lose a few yards, fellas. We're too far ahead of Bill Stern. Bill Stern, that's the Lawrence Olivier of the sports announcers. <laughs> when SMU drove down to Notre Dame's goal line, he made it sound so dramatic that a posse rode in from Houston. <laughs> they thought it was another attack on the Alamo. <laughs> and in honor of my latest picture, there were signs all over Fort Worth saying, the great lover is coming. When I got off the plane, somebody said, is that the great lover? I thought Alvin Barkley was a much younger man. <laughs> Say, hey friends, are you a bathtub baritone or a shower soprano? Because if you don't sing in the bathtub or whistle in the shower, you owe it to yourself to switch to Swan Soap. For Swan's wonderful free sudsing action really makes you want to sing when you bathe. Out of sheer delight, almost a minute it touches water, this miracle all-purpose floating soap turns up a mountain of suds that rinses away dirt and dust like magic, soothes your tender skin, and leaves you feeling as refreshed and relaxed as a soft breeze on a summer's day. No wonder mothers love to bathe baby in swan suds. Mild, pure swan is so gentle and safe, it's ideal for even delicate fabrics. And as for dishes, why, when free sudging swan goes into action in your dishpan, dirt and grime just seem to disappear. So switch to swan today for all your washing chores. 
Remember, it's the newer, better white floating soap with that wonderful free sudging action for face, hands, bath, and dishes. Les Brown and his band, ladies and gentlemen. You know, Capitol Records has just released a platter of this number by Maggie Whiting and yours truly. And here now to give it the swan touch is our Doris Day, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> just a bungalow for two, so right for each other. We won't need a view, we'll see one another. No glamour around us. But aren't you glad we found her? Mm. Mm. Lucky Lucky us. Though we haven't got a maid, they're so interesting. When we pull a shade, who's seeing, who's hearing? Two candles aglow. Our happiness is showing. Gee, gee. Lucky Lucky us. If we had a million... We might want a billion and be uneasy on our throne. But with love beside us, we're richer than Midas. Make the royal family jump. You know, I'll come home from work at night. We'll kiss in the doorway. Check eyes so shiny bright to welcome me your way. So happy. So humble. Too much in love to grumble. Lucky us. The rich pearly oysters who cluster in cloisters can never see beyond their rock. You can't kiss a bank book and gold has a blank look. Who, who could live in love and thought now? But Al Jolson. You know, there'll be socks and things to men. I'll keep you in chicken. Oh, that's a joke. Time is all we'll spend with us. Time is riches. So happy with all things because, because we have the small things. Gee, lucky us. Gee, lucky Well, folks, we all know that Christmas shopping costs money. So before Bob started out with his list, he stopped in at the bank. We now find him talking to the manager. Oh, I wouldn't take up your time like this, Mr. Brooks, but I'm an old customer of the bank, and this is a very important matter. Very well. Sit down, and I'll see that we're not disturbed. Uh, Miss Mullins, cancel my long-distance call to the Bank of England. Tell General Motors I'll be late for the conference and call Harry at Blair House and tell him we'll have to discuss that billion-dollar loan later. And see that I'm not disturbed. I have a very important meeting. Now, Mr. Hope, what is it you wish to see me about? Well, your calendar came, and I don't like it. (laughs) Do you mean to tell me you interrupted my business day for that? I don't like the calendar, that's all. I don't like it. Even my grocery store gives me one with a picture of a gorgeous petty girl in a negligee. Who wants to see Grandma Moses in a bare midriff? <laughs> Grandpa Moses. <laughs> now get out of here and don't bother me. You get out with that egg, will you, please? <laughs> well, I'm almost up to the teller's window. It sure was a long way. May I help you? Yes. Are those real $1,000 bills? That's there? right. Gee, is that stack over there real $5,000 bills? And are those $10,000 bills? Yes. Gee, what beautiful money... Would you mind stepping back, please? I'm going to close now, and I don't want to shut the window on your eyeballs. (laughs) Well, how do you like that guy shutting the window before I got a good look? But I can't get over that picture on a $10,000 bill. I can understand why Alexander Hamilton is on there, but why should he have his arm around Jack Benny? (laughs) Well, I better go over to the department store. I have to meet Doris. Oh, gee, Bob, this store is certainly crowded. Yeah, but I'm enjoying it. This is an interesting counter. And here's a present that would be just perfect for Crosby. A money belt with little suspenders around it. Bob, that's the lingerie department. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, I don't know about those things. I've never seen an unabridged Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> Have you seen these new personality dolls? They're made to look just like celebrities. Yeah, I know. Have you seen this one of Margaret Truman? It's great. She just press a button and leaves on a concert tour. <laughs> and have you seen the one of me, Doris? You? Yeah, since my latest picture, they brought out a great lover doll. You should see me as a little doll. I walk and talk and I even make love, just like in real life. Honest? Yeah, of course. You have to wind me up. Yeah. Just like in real life. <laughs> Or Jukebox Jenny. <laughs> Come over here. Yes, Bob. Where did you get that joke? I got it from Les Brown. Don't you think he should be a gag writer? I don't know. Let's wait and see how they classify him at the unemployment office. <laughs> but, Doris, let's go to the gift wrap counter and see if our. Hello, Doris. Hello, Mr. Well, Miss Ryan. Well, how are you? Did you see that? Goodness, Mr. Hope, I've never been so upset in my whole life. I should never go out in crowds like this. Now you are a little frail for it. Yes, I am. I should have known an accident would happen, and it did, too. The crowd pushed me, and I backed into one of those pneumatic suction tubes. <laughs> the next thing I knew, the cashier was poking around in my mouth for loose change. <laughs> My, Miss Ryan, your hair certainly looks different. Well, it ought to. I had to wait till they brought it back to me from the mezzanine. <laughs> Have you finished your shopping, Mr. Holmes? Well, everything but my Aunt Alice's present. I was thinking of buying her a pair of stockings, but I don't know her size. Well, uh, her legs anything like mine? No, hers go straight up and down. <laughs> a jazzy joke. That's cute. Yeah, all right. I'm so happy, Mr. Hope. I bought all my gifts this year, and I still have enough money to buy a dress for myself. Oh, how nice. Miss Ryan, why don't you spend the money for a formal, a strapless evening gown? Oh, no. <laughs> strapless gowns on me are confusing. <laughs> They're confusing? Yes. Yeah. On me, you can't tell whether it's a skirt that crept up too high or a sweater that slid down too high. <laughs> Boulevard, beautiful, Bob. Yeah, those Christmas trees really put you in the right mood. I'm really loaded with Christmas spirit. Oh, Bob, look, there's a Santa Claus ringing his bell. Yeah, Doris, let's stop and cheer him up. Hello, Santa. Merry Christmas. What's merry about it, boy? <laughs> My feet are killing me, and this California sunshine is giving me fog poisoning. <laughs> I wish I was out in Beverly Hills. The Santa Claus is out there have suits made out of mink trimmed with ermine. Well, where'd you get that suit you're wearing? You'd be surprised what you can do with a bottle of ketchup and some long underwear. <laughs> oh, things are miserable. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Toss something in the tambourine, boy. You really need a saddle? You wouldn't believe it if you could see the broken down shack my wife and I live in. Oh, sounds awful. Oh, it is. <laughs> the mice come in, take a look at us, and then send swan wrappers to care. <laughs> well, gee, I feel sorry for you, Santa. Oh, you ain't heard the half of it, boy. If we got thrown out of there, we wouldn't have any place to sleep at all if it wasn't for a friendly cab driver. You mean you sleep right in there? Fortunately, my wife has the kind of a head that fits right into the glove compartment. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Toss something in the tambourine, boy. Bob, I wouldn't give him anything. He sounds phony. Yeah, why should I give you any money? How do I know it's a legitimate cause? Oh, now you've hurt Santa's pride, boy. And I call you boy purely on speculation. <laughs> All this money will be used honestly. Bob, I'm sure he's not an authentic Kris Kringle. You should have seen me a couple of weeks ago. The department store furnished me with a real live reindeer. Well, where's the reindeer now? Well, it disappeared. And you know something? The manager of the department store accused me of eating it. It was a preposterous accusation. Well, did you deny it to the manager? Oh, yes. And I think I would have convinced him of my innocence, but I was picking my teeth with the antlers at the time. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you.
Swan wrappers from America mean soap for Europe's needy. Only 25 care swan days left. Send your swan wrappers to care, Boston 1, Massachusetts. And now we have a message from Rome, Italy. To hear from the Marchesa Maria Teodoli, national president of Goccia di Latte, an organization whose famous milk bars in Rome provide much-needed milk every morning of the year for over 3,000 undernourished Italian children. Ladies and gentlemen, Marchesa Teodoli. I'm very grateful, Mr. Hope, for this chance to thank you and all our American friends for the generous gifts of Swam Soap you have been sending to our needy boys and girls for your great care organization. If you could just visit our country long enough to see with your own eyes the smiles of pleasure your soap brings to the faces of these youngsters, you would feel even more keenly what a wonderful job you are doing to help ease the tragic after effects of war. Unfortunately, this distressing soap shortage isn't confined to Italy alone. It is all over Europe. The need is desperate everywhere. So keep up your good work by all means and help make this Christmas a truly clean Christmas for every needy child in Europe. For doing that, I humbly thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Marquesa Teodoli. Yes, swan wrappers from America mean soap for Europe's needy. Only 25 care swan days left. Send your swan wrappers to Care, Boston 1, Massachusetts. You can collect swan wrappers on your own or as a member of a group or organization. But man, woman, or child, whoever you are, wherever you may be, your help is needed. And your help, however small, will count, too. Because every two swan wrappers you mail into Care means another bar of soap for the needy children of Europe. So don't delay. Send in your swan wrappers now. And keep sending them in as fast as you can collect them to Care, Boston 1, Massachusetts. Remember, only 25 care swan days left. Look, buddy, can't you read the sign? Nobody is allowed backstage here at NBC without a pass. You ain't got a pass, so you can't go in. Now get out of here, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Benny, Jack Benny. <laughs> Benny, hey, you're the guy that went over to the other network, huh? Yes, yes. And now you come back here and you want to go inside. <laughs> Boy, you got guts. <laughs> I've got a general electric blanket, too. <laughs> now, look, listen, Mr. Benny, I really can't let you in without a pass. Mr. Hope will be through with his broadcast in a few minutes. Why don't you have a seat and wait? Well, thank you. All right, Dum 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 L S M S T Dum 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 Gosh, being back here at NBC gives me such a nostalgic feeling. It's almost like coming home. I have so many wonderful times here. Gee, I wish they could afford me. <laughs> well, the old place hasn't changed a bit. I used to sit in this very same seat and wait for Mary. I used to walk through that door every Sunday. And look, there's a payphone I used to call home after each broadcast. Hmm, I wonder... Hmm, my string is still here, but somebody took the nickel. <laughs> yeah, I wonder... Oh, here comes Hope down the hall. My, how he's aged. <laughs> Look at those bags under his eyes. He looks like a young Fred Allen. <laughs> no, he looks more like an old Fred Allen. What's the difference? Even a young Fred Allen looks like an old Fred Allen. <laughs> I just can't get over how awful Bob looks, huh? Hey, Mr. Holt, there's somebody here to see you. There is? Oh, Jack. Jack Benny. Oh, how are you, Bob? Gee, you look wonderful. <laughs> hmm. 
Jack, why didn't you come backstage to see me? Well, I wanted to, Bob, but this man behind the desk wouldn't let me through. I couldn't let him through, Mr. Hope. He didn't have a pass. Oh, he just sore because I went over to CBS. Shouldn't have said that word, Jack. Now we'll all be on bread and water for 30 days. <laughs> Say, look, Charlie. Anytime Mr. Benny wants to see me, he doesn't need a pass. I was just doing my job, Mr. Hope. You know the stumble bums we get backstage here? <laughs> How do I know he just wasn't trying to peddle Christmas cards? Oh, the very idea. Jack Benny peddling Christmas cards. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Tell him, Jack. <laughs> well, go ahead, Jack. Tell him. <laughs> okay, I'll take a half a dozen green ones. <laughs> Thank you. And, Bob, if you want to buy any of those rubber circus animals, be sure to give me a call. Rochester's at home blowing them up right now. <laughs> well, let's not talk here, Jack. Come on back to my dressing room. Okay. Well, make yourself comfortable, Jack Fine, I'll just sit in this chair here Oh, now, wait a minute I always sit in that chair But I'm sitting in it All right, you face the mirror <laughs> Can I get you something, Jack? A cigarette? No, no, thanks I just finished one Cup of coffee? Coffee? Gee, it's been weeks since I had a cup <laughs> Well, why? On account of the high prices? No. Well, it's not that, Bob. All right, then have a cup. Oh, how much? <laughs> it's free, Jack. And after you're through, I'll wrap up the grounds for you to take home. <laughs> It'll be delicious with your Saratan. <laughs> Well, tell me, Jack, what did you want to see me about? Well, I don't even like to bring this up, Bob, because it's probably an oversight on your part, but your new picture, The Great Lover, is doing so well, and since I was in the picture and more or less contributed to its success, uh, don't you think it's only fair that you, um, that is, well, I mean, uh... What are you trying to say, Jack? To toss something in the tambourine, boy. <laughs> Well, what do you mean? Well, after all, when you called me in to save, uh, to appear in your picture, I thought there was money involved. Well, there was. You cost Paramount thousands. Remember that week we had to stop shooting so you could go up to Fresno and pick up a few bucks during the great crushing season? <laughs> well, 30 cents an hour is nothing to sneeze at, you know. No, and with that stain on your feet, you won't have to buy socks for a year. <laughs> hmm. There's a nice line for a guest star. Hmm. You played it well. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Bless you. <laughs> I can't think of another word. I can, but you can't do it. Come on. Hey, Roberto. Pretty low to top that. What are you here. saying? Get out of Stromboli. Either give me a joke pretty soon or give me my money, will you? <laughs> oh, forget it, Jack. Forget it. A man my age has to start thinking about money. After all, when you get to be 39, you know, your earning power is cut down a bit. How old are you? 39. Going on 38. <laughs> oh, that's what I like about you, Jack. You don't keep changing your age. You get one you like and stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Bob, I hate to compromise, but if you'll pay me the money, I'll play one of the songs from your picture on my show next week. Well, which one? Well, how about a thousand violins I've been uh, practicing with? You have? Yes, I have my violin right here. I'll show you. Uh, let me get it out. <laughs> Jack, is that a tin cup in your case? Yes, I keep my rods in it. <laughs> <laughs> and get your foot off that dime. <laughs> Okay, let's hear you play a thousand violins. Okay. Just want to warm up a little bit. 
I got so much talent, it scares me, you know? <laughs> scares me, too. <laughs> okay, anytime, Evelyn. <laughs> So far, Bob. Sounds like something the mule train left behind. <laughs> you know, he's right. I'm a jackass for coming over here. <laughs> you played it well. <laughs> now, wait a minute. That's not in the song. That's not in the song. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute! Well, what do you say, Bob? Do I get the money? Jack, stop talking about the money. Tell you what I'll do. I'll put it in the bank for you. It'll accumulate interest, and someday you'll have a nice nest egg. A nest egg? Look, great lover, I'm a working man, not an Easter bunny. <laughs> Bob, I was depending on that money to buy Christmas presents. Really? Yes, I was just making up my list. I have to get presents for Mary and her father and mother, her sister Babe and her brother, and something for Dennis and Phil and Don and Rochester. Well, gee, how much do you need? Mm, give me five dollars and we'll call it. <laughs> All thanks for the memory. That's it, huh? I want to thank Jack Bennett very much and also Lucky Strikes. Thanks, Jack, for the memory of a swell evening. And I want to say thanks to that big and big-hearted state of Texas and that titanic Texan, Monty Moncrief and Eamon Carter, for the memory of the big milk fun show in Fort Worth last week. And thanks to Notre Dame and Southern Methodist for the memory of that all-American thriller in the Cotton Bowl. Brother, that one made history. In fact, the Lone Star State is now rewriting a history book to read Remember the Alamo and Never Forget SMU versus Notre Dame. It was one of the greatest exhibitions of college spirit of this or any year. And another wonderful example of college spirit is the Living War Memorial Fund of the University of Southern California. You know, each year on the Trojan campus, an organization of student veterans, Trovets they're called, put on a drive to raise funds for scholarships for the children and their buddies who didn't come back. Good luck, Trovets. Believe me, no touchdown drive can ever equal yours. Good night, folks. Let's get those Christmas packages in the mail early. Let's give our pal the mailman a break. Don't break his back. Good night. <laughs> that girl everyone's raving about. She's found her own rave number on the dial of wave chart. Now she's my number one rave. She's my sweet, sweetheart. Rave and only Rave Home Permanent brings you the easy-to-use dial a wave chart to end guesswork in home waving. A flick of your finger and there's your rave number, your personal guide to the perfect wave for your kind of hair. So fast, yet so sure... Rave Home Permanent gives you exactly the amount of curl you want. Long-lasting, yet more natural from the very first day. Coming up, it's Fibber McGee and Molly on NBC. Bob Hope will make you laugh every day in the Los Angeles Examiner. Be sure to read his mirthful column daily in the Examiner. Jack Benny was born Benjamin Kabelski in 1894. Benny began violin lessons at the age of six. His parents hoped he would become a concert violinist, but he hated to practice. He did love to play the violin, though. He just loved to play it for fun. He began to play it in vaudeville theaters in 1911. It was during this time that he met the Marx Brothers, and he began a lifelong friendship with the entire family, but especially Zeppo Marx. He enlisted in the Navy during World War I and was kept busy entertaining the troops, and it was during this time that he began to focus more on comedy and less on playing the violin. In 1922, Jack Benny went to a Passover Seder in Vancouver, British Columbia, where he met 17-year-old Sadie Marx. No, she's no relation to the Marx Brothers, even though it was Zeppo Marx who invited Benny to that Passover celebration. Sadie Marks was unimpressed with Jack Benny when they first met, and Jack Benny never remembered their initial meeting, but four years later they met again, and they fell for each other, and they were married in 1927. 
Now, Sadie was also a comedian, and under her stage name of Mary Livingston, her and Jack Benny worked together for decades. Benny continued to play vaudeville in nightclubs until 1932 when he won a guest spot on the Ed Sullivan radio show. Later that year, Jack Benny began a 23-year radio career with the Jack Benny Show that ran from 1932 to 1948 on NBC and from 1949 to 1955 on CBS. Now, you heard all the jokes in today's show about Jack Benny switching networks. You see, CBS had lured a lot of talent away from NBC with offers of more money. Some of the shows that went over to CBS from NBC were Amos and Andy, George Burns and Gracie Allen, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, and Red Skelton. Bob Hope, however, never left NBC. Jack Benny was first on television in 1949, and from 1950 to 1965, he did a TV version of the Jack Benny program. Even after all her years of performing with her husband, Jack, his wife, Mary, couldn't get over the stage fright that TV gave her, so she didn't appear on television with Jack. He did make a few films, but the stage, radio, and TV were where Jack Benny triumphed. After his TV show was dropped in 1965 because, well, viewership had changed, he went to Lake Tahoe and became a headliner for Harris Casino and Hotel. We will soon get to the Jack Benny show here on this podcast, and you will see how funny he was. Jack Benny died of pancreatic cancer on December 26, 1974, at the age of 80. At the funeral, George Burns, Benny's best friend for more than 50 years, attempted to deliver a eulogy but broke down shortly after he began and was unable to continue. Bob Hope also delivered a eulogy in which he stated, For a man who was the undisputed master of comedic timing, you would have to say this is the only time when Jack Benny's timing was all wrong. He left us much too soon. His will arranged for a long-stemmed red rose to be delivered to his widow, Mary Livingstone, every day for the rest of her life. Now, the football game that Bob Hope referred to was an historic game for Notre Dame. By winning that game against SMU, Notre Dame won the national championship that year, and they went undefeated with a record of 10-0. and the Irish were coached by Frank Leahy. And this 1949 team became the seventh fighting Irish team to win the national title and the third in four years. Led by Heisman Trophy winner Leon Hart, the Irish outscored their opponents 360 to 86. The 1949 team is the last in what is considered to be the Notre Dame football dynasty. There was a stretch of games for about four years in which Notre Dame went 46-0 and 2 and won three national championships and two Heisman trophies. This Fighting Irish squad was cited by Sports Illustrated as the second best sports dynasty, professional or collegiate, in all of the 20th century. In case you're curious, the number one sports dynasty was the Boston Celtics, led by Bill Russell. Please send your questions and comments to host at ClassicComedyOTR.com. Come back next Wednesday for another episode of The Bob Hope Show, and check in on Friday for the next installment of The Life of Riley. Please go to our website, ClassicComedyOTR.com. Click on the Become a Patron button or the Donate button to support our show. It's very much needed and very much appreciated. Until we meet again, in the words of Rose Kennedy, Birds sing after a storm. Why shouldn't people feel as free to delight in whatever sunlight remains to them? <laughs>